As I reflected on the story this morning from Luke, as I was reflecting and studying and praying through it, I thought about an experience I had a few years ago. When we were living on the big island of Hawaii. At that time, we were living on the Kona side. My wife gave me a, a wonderful gift for my birthday. She gave me two days, or two days and one night, at a Buddhist monastery on the Hilo side, which is a more tropical side of the island. It was a, a well-known Buddhist temple. And so I had never, I had never driven to that area before. It was going to be a new experience, and I was so excited. The scenery is so gorgeous. But to get there, you, you basically have to drive from where we were, you have to drive all the way to, to the southern tip of the island and then back up. So it was a pretty good drive, but it was a sort of a desolate drive, a scenic drive. And as I was trying to find the right road to be on, because there was only one road that I needed to get on, but I missed it. And so I had to turn around and I saw I saw some county workers on the side of the road doing some work on a power line or something. And so I just pulled over and I got out and I started talking story. That's what we call it on the island, just talking story. You know how that is, Dave. And I finally asked them, you know, how do I, how do I get to this Buddhist monastery, this Buddhist temple? And uh, they gave me the correct directions. It wasn't hard. I, just, I had to find that one road that, that went to that place. And as we finished our conversation, uh, he looked at me and said, Brother, when you get back in your car, don't get back out of your car until you get close to the, the temple. You don't want to get out and walk around in this area. Some not so nice people around here. He recognized my vulnerability. It wasn't a reflection on the Hawaiian culture, it was a reflection of the area. It was, a, it was a high addiction rate in that area, a lot of alcoholism and addiction in that specific area that he was talking about. He was saying, don't get out of the car being all nice to people. Some not so nice people around here. And so I listened to him, Dave. I got in the car and I drove and I didn't, I didn't get out until I got to the temple. I thought about that when reflecting on this story. This man was traveling a dangerous road. The early audience of this story, Jesus, listeners of the story, they would have recognized the dangers on that road to Jericho. Some not so nice people on that road. Places to hide, ambushes. So this man was left beaten, half dead, robbed. And then Jesus spoke about the first folks that walked by, the Levi and the, the priest. And we have to understand that Jesus' listeners were just ordinary folk like us. Some were peasants, but they were not a part of the elite class. And so they would have been eager to hear what happened with the Levite and the priest. And Jesus confirmed what they were already thinking, that the Levite and the priest didn't care. They just walked right on by. And I could just sense those earliest listeners hearing that story go, yep, that's exactly what they would do. They would have been justified in their way of thinking about that situation. Yep, that's exactly what the Levites and the priests would have been doing right there. That's how I experienced them. And then they would have expected Jesus to talk about an ordinary Jewish man or woman just like themselves. That would help. They were waiting on that. Someone they could identify with. But Jesus instead, as Jesus normally does, he shot them. He didn't say a Jew, Jewish peasant was coming down that same road and stopped and helped the Samaritan. No, or helped the man. He said, no, there was a Samaritan man or a Samaritan. And right then and there, the audience would have just... They may have had a hard time hearing anything after that. Because we all know how much, how much hatred that during that time the Jewish folks had toward the Samaritans. It was a, 
It was a bitter relationship with a long history. The two did not get along. And so a Samaritan would have been the last person on the face of the earth that Jesus' audience would have wanted to hear that actually helped the man on the side of the road. And to take that story and really sit with it and wrestle with it. If you were in need and completely vulnerable, Doug, who is the last person that you would want to come and help you? That's the question we must ask ourselves this morning. Gail, I could probably answer the question for you. I can tell you who the last person I would want to see coming to help me if I were beaten on the side of the road, robbed and in need. If I saw a pickup truck pull up and a white dude jump out with an M-A-G-A hat on. <laughs> Make America great again. Honestly, I would rather him just get back in his truck and drive off. Leave me. I don't need your help. Who is the last person that you would want helping you? You have to answer that question in order to really get into the parable, into the story, and understand what it felt like for Jesus' audience to hear the story. They were shocked. They didn't know what to make of it. And there are different ways that we can look at this story this morning, different ways of interpreting the story, of wrestling with the story. But I want to focus on grace. Because I don't know about you, I need a lot of grace. And to me, this story says that God has the freedom to express God's grace and love and mercy and compassion however God chooses to reveal it and demonstrate it and work it in our lives. That we cannot constrain mercy. We cannot put boundaries around mercy. Mercy is relentless and fierce in this life. And that oftentimes grace and mercy and love and compassion show up and awaken us in ways that we would not have expected it and perhaps through people that we would choose for it not to have been expressed through. That God has that freedom to reveal and express God's mercy in ways that we can never imagine. The Jewish audience that heard this story would not have expected grace and mercy and love and forgiveness to be expressed through this Samaritan. But that is exactly, exactly how God did so. God has that freedom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Perhaps we're the ones, perhaps, that try to constrain God's grace, love, and mercy, and compassion, our lives. And I think it says something else too. That perhaps every human being, or almost, almost every human being has that capacity for love and mercy and kindness and compassion. Perhaps. When I was in New York, served the uh, first congregation in Rockaway Beach. All of you probably know that. And when they went through the open and affirming process before I arrived, there was a lot of resistance. There were folks, beautiful folks in the congregation who, just because of their cultural background or religious background, weren't quite ready for the church to become open and affirming. They really struggled with it. One such person was Miss Sylvia. Miss Sylvia had been in the church for many, many years, and she was the loudest, loudest resistant to the church becoming open and affirming. Well, the church became open and affirming anyway, and most of the folks who, like Miss Sylvia, who showed so much resistance, they stayed anyway because they loved the church. By the time I got there, the church was 
slowly starting to become open and affirming. Because there's a difference between being open and affirming and living out that call. It's a lifelong call of living out open and affirming. So when I got there, we were beginning to live out that call. And I remember Keith and Edwin, they joined the church not long after I, I arrived, Keith and Edwin. And they were, they were not married at the time because the law didn't allow them to be married. But they had been together for years and years and years and years. And it was so, it was beautiful. Sylvia and Keith built a friendship. I think that she was his deacon. And she would call Keith and they built this, this friendship. And even when Keith and Edmund left the church because of something, I forgot what happened. They left the church, you know, that happens in church sometimes. They left the church for a period of time, and then Keith and Evan, they came back to FCC right before Hurricane Sandy. And you know what happened in Hurricane Sandy, right? The whole church was flooded out, and, you know, Rockaway Beach was a, looked like a war zone for some time. And I spoke with Keith because the law had passed somewhere around that time or before that time legalizing same-sex marriage. And Keith and Edmund were ready to get married. They had waited long enough. And I said, Keith, you know we don't have any power in the church. There's no electricity or power. Are you, it's going to be cold. Are you, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, I want to do it now. So okay, let's do it. So we got the champagne. We got ready for the celebration. And I'm standing at the, the at the pulpit near the pulpit with with Keith with Keith. And the music starts playing. And I'm looking for Evan because he's going to be coming down the aisle. And guess who was walking him down the aisle? In her dress, with a big smile on her face. God's grace and mercy and love and compassion cannot be constrained. And oftentimes, love and compassion and mercy and kindness show themselves in ways that we could never imagine and through people that we would have not expected. What am I saying, church? Don't lose hope. We can't lose hope in people. We can't lose hope. And we should never lose hope. God's mercy, love, and compassion. Amen. Amen. Turn around and look at one another. And greet one another. Namaste. Namaste. Recognize the dignity and worth of one another. Recognize the love of God in one another. We are the church. Amen? Amen. We are called to love one another, to care for one another, to be there for one another, to travel this journey together. Amen? Amen. We don't walk it alone. We're called to join together in participating with God and making God's reign a reality on this earth. We don't wait for it. We work with God now for a just world for all. We speak, speak truth to power. Amen. 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 I'll say it again. We speak truth to power. Amen. Amen. And we get into some good trouble along the way. Amen. 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 And receive this blessing, church family. May the blessing of God go before you. May God's grace and peace abound. May God's spirit live within you. May God's love wrap around you. Amen. Amen. Oh, I left some out. <laughs> My goodness. Can leave out the blessing. And may God's blessing remain with you always. May you walk on holy ground. Amen. Amen. And my goodness, we don't have... Let me do, can I do a post loop with y'all? <laughs> it's an easy hymn. Can I do it with you? Yeah. Yes.
I don't have musical abilities, but when I sing this hymn, I can get into it. I know you know it, so please stand with me. So here we go. One of my favorites, I used to sing it with Solomon when he was, in, oh, oh, since he was born, we'd go into church. So, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Singing and praying with my mind. Stay on Jesus. Singing and praying with my mind. Stay on Jesus. Singing and praying with my mind. Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. 